Hello everyone and welcome to our Chemistry Daily Booster. This is number eight in our series and what we're covering today is listed on the advanced information topic list for both higher chemistry and foundation chemistry. So it's relevant for everyone today. What we're going to do in today's little daily boost then is have a look at some of the properties of materials. So to start us off, we're going to have a look at changes of state. Now, the first thing we actually need to do here is understand what happens to a substance when the state actually changes. So if we consider the scenario where we're going from a solid to a liquid, then what we see there is some of the bonds are breaking. That means that the particles are then freer to move. If we then think about what happens as we go from a liquid to a gas, then that means all of the remaining bonds break, which means the particles are now nice and separate, free to move in any direction that they like. So think back to the work we've done in C1, looking at the particle model. Think about, obviously, the way the particles are arranged in a solid, a liquid and a gas. And you can then kind of almost apply logic to work out what must happen to go from that fixed regular arrangement in the solid to the more random arrangement for the liquid and then to the very spaced out random arrangement in the gas. It's all about breaking bonds between those individual particles. In terms of how much energy this takes, then what we find is that the stronger the bond and the more of them that there are, then the greater the energy we have to transfer from the surroundings to the substance in order to actually break them. So this gives us that little link in to things like our melting point and our boiling point. So if you're asked why it is that a substance has a high melting point, then you need to say that it has many strong bonds and be specific in the solid state because melting point means it's going from a solid to a liquid. If they ask you about why something has a high boiling point, this is obviously looking at that change of state from a liquid to a gas. So same first part of the answer has many strong bonds, but this time we need to specify it's in the liquid state. So don't forget that little bit of detail there just to specify which state it has those many strong bonds in. The second property we're going to consider is whether something is brittle or malleable. Now, brittle means that it just snaps. Malleable means that you can change its shape through bending, for example. Now, the difference between whether a substance is going to be brittle or malleable comes down to how easily the particles can change their positions within the lattice structure. So if they can change their places very easily, then they're going to be malleable. If they can't change places easily, then it's going to be brittle. What we're going to do then is we're going to take each of the main categories of substance and see what happens in each case and why. So first on the list is metals. Hopefully we remember from our earlier work in C2 that metal ions are held in that lattice by metallic bonds. So you've got that force of attraction between the delocalized electrons and the positive metal ions in that structure and those force of attraction, the metallic bonds. If we apply a large enough force to our piece of metal, then what we're going to see is those positive metal ions are able to slide over each other. Now, bonds are not actually breaking because those delocalized electrons can actually move around the structure. So what we see there is applying force means the metal ions and the delocalized electrons can just sort of move around each other to a certain extent and therefore we can bend it. It is malleable. Second category are giant covalent structures. These ones, if we apply a large enough force, then what we're going to find is a brittle response. That means that many covalent bonds are going to break at the same time, and therefore it just shatters. In terms of an ionic compound, same thing. If we apply a large enough force, many ionic bonds break simultaneously, and therefore the substance is going to break. So it doesn't bend, just breaks. So ionic compounds, giant covalent structures, large enough force applied, many bonds break, leading to the substance obviously shattering. Just remember to be specific on the bond type. So if we're talking about giant covalent structures, just include the word covalent between many and bonds. If we're talking ionic compounds, shove the word ionic between many and bonds. 
We then come on to our simple molecules. So these are our small things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc. If they're in the solid state with their molecules arranged in a lattice, they may well be brittle. If they're not arranged as a lattice, they may be flexible. So it really is a kind of depends on what substance we're talking about and how those particular molecules have arranged themselves when they're in the solid state. The last one, the polymers, again, it depends on how they're arranged. Think about polymers, most common ones you will be able to think of are types of plastic. So the kind of, let's think of a good example, your school rulers. So what you find there is they claim they're not going to shatter, but as we all know, if you apply a big enough force, it does. So some types of plastic, you apply a big enough force, it does just shatter. Whereas other types of plastic, think cling film, for example, you can apply a range of forces and it changes shape, it's quite flexible. So it does depend on how the individual molecules are arranged within the polymers and the simple molecules. Third property, conduction. If we think about conduction of electricity then, in order to conduct electricity, it's got to have one of two things able to move, basically. Either delocalized electrons, because they are a charged particle, or ions. So we've got to have some form of charged particle that is free to move. If you don't have charged particles that are free to move, it cannot conduct electricity. So if we start off with our metals once more, as we know from our diagrams of the metallic bonding and the metallic structures, then we've got the positive metal ions and we have delocalized electrons. So that means that metals are able to conduct when they're in either the solid or the liquid state because the delocalized electrons are free to move. If we think about ionic compounds, so these are where we've got positive and metal ions held together within a structure, then what we find is as a solid, they will not conduct because the ions are not free to move. However, if we dissolve them or we make them molten, so basically you melt it, then we will have ions that are free to move and therefore it will conduct electricity. So remember that very simple distinction in our ionic compounds. Solids cannot conduct electricity because the ions cannot move. Either molten or dissolved ionic compounds can conduct electricity because the ions can move. The last ones are simple molecules, polymers and giant covalent structures. None of them conduct electricity because they do not have delocalized electrons, nor do they have any ions that are free to move. So the only ones that can conduct are metals and ionic compounds if they're in the right state. The last little thing we're going to consider in today's booster is nanoparticles. Now, the definition of a nanoparticle is something that is between one nanometer and 100 nanometers across. So anything between one and 100 nanometers across is a nanoparticle. And do remember our little maths link there that one nanometer is the same as one times 10 to the minus nine meters. Because a maths question they could give you is converting between nanometers, meters, etc. If we talk about nanoparticulate, this is just a material made from nanoparticles. And what we need to be aware of here is an individual nanoparticle is going to have certain properties. If we then have large amounts of those nanoparticles together in this material, this nanoparticulate, we can see that they actually have different properties to the individual nanoparticle on its own. So when they're in bulk, the property can vary from when they're an individual particle. So a good example there is titanium dioxide. Now, when we have it as an individual nanoparticle, then it's transparent. When we have them in bulk, what we find is it's white. So the color is completely different just because we've now got them as this bulk material. In terms of what we can use these nanoparticles for then, first of all, they're incredibly small, as we've established, they are nanoparticles, and this makes them incredibly useful in things like paints, cosmetics, sunscreens, etc. And one of the kind of key areas that there's a lot of good work going on with these nanoparticles is in things that need a catalyst. 
So what we find there is because they've got this very large surface area to volume ratio, they're incredibly good as, used as catalysts. Other areas you'll find them used there is in self-cleaning windows, which are actually a genuine thing. So that just means you don't have to send people up on giant kind of ladders or these things that drop down from the tops of buildings to clean the windows, because we can apply basically a film which contains these nanoparticles onto the surface that basically means the dirt doesn't stay on the windows. There are, of course, some downsides. This is a new material in the grand scheme of things. They are incredibly tiny, as we've established, so there is always the potential we can breathe them in. There is the potential that because they're so small, they could absorb through the skin and even pass into our cells because they are so tiny. Now, we don't really know what the long term effects might be of these nanoparticles in the human body because they've not been around for a very long period of time. So that might be something we work out actually there is a problem later on, but at the moment nothing untoward is coming out. We do know they take a long time to break down in the environment, which obviously if there is a problem with them in the long term could be a big issue if they're not going to break down. And perhaps the more concerning one there is that toxic substances can stick to the surface. So that means if we do have toxins sticking to the surface, it's then staying in the environment for a long time and potentially able to gain entry to our bodies. OK, there might be some problems there. But as I say, as far as I am aware, we haven't found any definitive links with any particular issues at this time. So final thing to do for today then is of course head on over and have a go at the quiz to see how well you've understood the topics for today. If there are still gaps in your knowledge, then do make sure that you use either the main videos on the channel or use your revision materials to make sure you understand this before your exam. Don't forget to join us again tomorrow for our next Chemistry Daily Booster.